Hey everyone, today we're talking about the truth about heaters. Why can't we make one that works forever, right? Is it the heater or is it us? I believe it's us. And so let me give you the background here. <clears throat> I've used Ebo Jagger heaters, Eheim, the green ones that last forever in a day that were very long. And I've used a lot of new heaters and we sell, you know, digital ones with those LEDs and all that kind of stuff. And what I find to be the problem is the way in which we use them. Now, I specifically went to China this year to explore heaters. We also talked to some Polish manufacturers about it. And what I've learned is basically there's not really much innovation going on. And what I mean by that is at a certain point, we're supplying electricity to water. And so here I've got the flu ball heater and I've taken off the, the guard so that fish won't get burned, right? And if you look here, you can see there's basically these metal elements in there. There we go. So those are in little rungs, basically. Now, this is just like a heater if you were to have a space heater in your house. You watch them, they get red hot, heat comes off of them, there you go. The difference is we need to keep the water from touching that. So now we have this glass tube that is waterproof. Right? Simple enough. All right, can't touch the electricity. No problem. Now, the problems I think we get into is that we all want a smaller heater. We want it more powerful. And we want it where we want it. And I think that's where we fall into the problem. So this is a 100 watt heater. And it's this long, right? And you can actually see on here, there's a little bit of, what do I want to call that? Like heat marks, if you will, like right here. I don't know if it will focus in on there. Right there, you can see a little bit of fogging of the glass. That's heat. Heat does that. Now, one of the, the biggest complaint we get about the flu ball heaters is when they flash LF, low flow, right? And so flu ball tried to address this problem and they failed because we as hobbyists are failing. But the goal was if we can move water around the heater really well, it won't overheat. And that's going to lead to a lot longer life, right? So I think the problem is we need to stop looking at this as a device that's going to work forever. And instead, look at it on an on and off cycle. So for instance, if we have a light switch and we sit there and just go off and on, 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 and we do that for a few days, it's going to pop, right? No longer works because it's only got so many on and off cycles. That being said, we know if you turn a light bulb on and never turn it off, like 10 years later, still running. That's because the on off, that's the hard part. The same thing goes on in our heater. So with our heaters, we have both uh, electronic, basically, uh, well, sensors and uh, switches to turn on and off. And then we have bimetallic. And the bimetallic means there's two pieces of metal, kind of as it heats up, it goes, oh, got hot enough, turn off. Ah, cools back down. Oh, not hot enough anymore. Boom, right? And we have a, a temperature sensor there as well. Okay, so if we know those are the two ways heaters are working, think of it like our household heater again, like, okay, so we need to monitor how warm it is in the room or the aquarium. And then we need to make sure that this heater turns on or off based on that. All right, now here is another way I think we're going wrong. We wanna, right now all the marketing is like, this heater is accurate within 0.2 of a degree. And I don't believe that's good for us. Just like our homes. Could you imagine if your home heater turns on every time you walked in the room? You'd walk in the room, a little bit of cooler air would come in and 0.2 degrees. So it goes from, let's say 70 in your house to 69.8. Boom, that heater kicks on and now it's gonna bump it up to 72, right? And so that's also a problem, but it's gonna shut off earlier than that because it's 0.2 sensitivity. So we've got these very fine uh, points. Now, in the wild for our fish, and much like us humans, we don't have to live that way. We don't have to live like, oh, if it gets, you know, if it's 70 and it goes to 72 or it goes to 62, for the most part, we're okay as a human. The fish, kind of the same way because they can go deeper in a pond, they can come up, they can go deeper in a river, all of that. They can withstand the fluctuations. Where do we get into trouble? We get into trouble when we don't have enough heat at all. So if it's 30 degrees and I freeze to death outside, that's a problem. Same thing for my fish. If we get way too cold, we're gonna get sick, that's a problem. But we could just heat enough, right? It doesn't have to be 78 or 80 exactly. We know that like, okay, with these fish, if it goes below 72, 
I might start seeing some illness. So if we keep it at 74 to 80, we're good, right? So I actually believe we want to heat water above the danger zone, but not as hot as it'll go. And here's the reason why. The hotter we go, the more you're going to tax a heater. If your house, if you set it to, it needs to be 100 degrees, your heater will basically never turn off and it's gonna be really taxing on that system, right? Uh, if we set it at 75, every time you open the door to go outside or something like that, that heater's gonna kick on, it's another on-off cycle. So what we're trying to do is we're actually trying to get what are the least amount of on and off times we can get in a day to extend the life of this heater? Optimally, we might sit at 74. It goes, dink, 73, like, uh oh, we're a little bit under where we wanna be. Let's turn this heater on. And then it goes, whoop, over the course of four or five hours, we hit 78, turn off. And then maybe it does that once more per day, right? Maybe it's doing that once every 12 hours. Whereas something like this right now, we got to set at 78. The minute it goes to 68.8 or 60, 77.8, boom, it's going to kick back on. And it's going to be on and offing 50 times, 100 times a day. Now that's exacerbated by if you don't have a top on your aquarium or your room is drafty or you're doing a water change or anything that's going to change the temperature there. And so as an aquarist, we can make this easier. We can... Uh, Use tops. I highly recommend if you don't have a top, well, I don't know what to tell you, you know, get one. If you got a roomless tank, that's one of the downfalls. You're going to have more heater failures than someone else, all right? We know that acrylic tanks hold heat better than a glass tank, so that gives you a little bit more of an edge. Uh, but what I believe, so if we're trying to regulate on and offs, this 100 watt heater, if I put it next to a 300 watt heater, and now we put them in this, like two tanks that are identical. A 100 watt heater might hit 74, turn on and stay on for six hours, and then it hits that cutoff temp, kicks off. The 300 watt heater might hit that in an hour. So it turns on, hits it, and then starts cooling down, right? So then maybe at the three hour mark, the 300 watt heater kicks on again, because oh, it cooled back down. Oh, we better kick back on. So we might get three cycles out of this heater in the same time that we're getting one cycle. And that's that cycle count we're worried about. Now, the other parts is we want a small heater. Just the hobby in general. Maybe you don't care, maybe I don't care, but the people that walk into a fish store, they want something not bulky, not obtrusive, not expensive, they want these things. So that's where you see in a heater, you'll see that, okay, the 100 watt heater is 55 bucks. All right, the 200 watt heater is $57, because all they're doing is they're extending the coils a little bit more, right? And then the 300 watt heater is a little bit more, What's not changing though is the flow in your aquarium. So this 100 watt heater versus a 300 watt heater, if we have a sponge filter sitting by and it's moving some flow, we know that it's heating slowly and we've got time to get that heat and distribute it around the aquarium. 300 watts is heating three times as fast. We need three times as much flow. Most times we don't do that. And what that does, that creates hot spots. So one of the reasons like why a flu ball heater wants you to put it at uh, a 45 degree angle, so don't mount it like this, mount it like this, is so that the heat coming from here rises up and gets whisked away and doesn't instantly rise up into the temperature sensor. Like it's gonna premature sh turn on and off quickly because the heat's rising right around it. And so that's why we want this angle. Now, that's one recommendation to do, but two, get the flow going well. And a lot of people say, my last heater didn't have to have that. Chances are your last heater didn't have a flow uh, sensor. So it did need that, but that's why it failed. Like that's one of the conundrums of like, oh, the last car I had never needed an oil change. Like, but you bought a new car because the engine exploded from no oil. Like that, oh, you shouldn't run the next car of like, I'll never do an oil change. You should go, I learned from that. And now I know how to prevent that. And that's what we're doing here is we wanna prevent that. So you can imagine, a 100 watt heater tilted to the side with good flow, much less on and off cycle time. Uh, it's gonna stay on, we're gonna move that heat around for a lot longer versus a 300 watt right up and down with not a lot of flow. That thing's gonna be kicking on and off all the time. Heat rises, kicks off, cools down a little bit, kicks on, kicks off, kicks on, kicks off. And eventually you're gonna wear out the mechanics. And so I believe 
in your aquarium, go ahead and put less wattage than you need, and then conserve as much heat as you can, and don't discount other heat sources. And what I mean by that is your filter, something like a, a Fluval FX6 on this aquarium back here, 50 watts of energy. That's the same as having a 50 watt heater running all the time, never turns off. There's transmission from heat from your lights, power heads, uh, even if your room is warmer and you're pumping in air, you're transferring a tiny bit of heat there even. So there's a bunch of ways that heat's going into your aquarium. We should be focusing on how do we stop losing that heat and then supplement when we've identified we can no longer stop losing heat. Think of it like your house. The first thing you do, close the windows, close the door, make sure you've got insulation, make sure what heat you do have you're retaining. From there, turn the heater on. That's exactly what we need to be doing in our aquariums, and that's why we get so many failures. Right now, we've got the window open, we've got the door open, we've got the heater cranked, and uh, it's turning on and off. It's 400 degrees in the room with the, uh, the heater, and the rest of the house is chilly. You've got that going on in your aquarium, and it's just a recipe for disaster. And so we need to take a more active role in uh, splitting up our needs here. So first, preserve energy. Second, or preserve heat, which is preserving energy. Energy basically is heat. Preserve what you have. Then let's supplement it in smart ways. So even if I wanted 300 watts of heater, I recommend doing three 100 watt heaters because you can space them out. So imagine, like we talked about it, that a 300 watt heater might be this much longer. Well, three of these is this long. You've got all this surface area to disperse the heat. Maybe you've got one in each corner and one in the middle, all at a 45 degree angle. Your aquarium is locked in. You probably find you didn't even need 300 watts. Like, oh, I really only needed like 150 watts. But, you know, thinking about it from not this is what's recommended, but what you need. Because an aquarium in your garage needs a lot more heat than one in your living room because you're gonna heat the house normally. So I recommend diversifying your heaters. In a perfect world, if my campaign worked, we would only ever sell 100 watt heaters and everyone would only use 100 watt heaters. That's caught on over in uh, Europe and Asia and that kind of stuff where like, oh yeah, lots of 100 watt heaters because when one fails, one heater is either sticking on or off and you've got other ones to make up some of the difference. So if it sticks on, it takes a lot longer. We already established three times as long to heat it up. And if it never turns on, you've got two more to kind of pull up the slack till you notice like, hey, we're running a little bit cold. The next thing I would do if you really want to dial it in is get a separate temperature probe, get a heater controller that you can plug this into. That will give you one extra device that will, if this was to stick on, that it would catch that. Now, that's kind of like taking your car in for an oil change. You have the mechanic look at it. They go, hey, by the way, your belt's wearing. You need to get that replaced in the next six months. That's that fail safe there. That's what that extra thing is doing. It can fail. Your mechanic can miss that something was going wrong, just like your um, heater controller can go faulty as well. But I believe if you do all the precursor steps, don't drive your car like an idiot. You know, give it some oil changes, do some maintenance, conserve, and then you'll get more usage out of your heater. And know that this is not a forever product. If it's got a thousand on and off cycles, which I don't know that because I, I don't, I never got access to their data on like where did it fail. But if it's only got a thousand cycles and it turns on and off three times a day, that's a year, right? Imagine it only turns off once a day, three years, right? So automatically you're gonna get much more longevity. And I believe the Evo Jaggers and heaters of yesteryear that were much bigger that we tolerated as a hobbyist uh, actually spread out the heat enough that they weren't getting all those on and off switches. What Another thing that happened was we got rules that said we can't have electronics fully submersible. So a lot of times there's a minimum and a maximum line, like don't put it in past this. That came to be while I was working at a fish store and it was like all of a sudden the packaging said, it was the same heater. Just the next batch said, oh, you can't put it below this line. You're like, it's the same heater that for the last 10 years we've been putting under the water. They didn't want to get the, the right certification, like an, probably an IP rating or something like that. They never paid for it. And so then all heaters became like, well, just kind of put them in, but not too far because we don't want to pay that. That's, that was the downfall, the starting of the heater thing, I think. And I think companies and myself included, we want heaters to break. We make money, right? But the truth is, if we're very smart about how we're managing the energy, we should be getting a lot longer out of these heaters. 
One last use case would be the cobalt heater. The cobalt heater had the 100 watt and the two and the 300 watt. Very expensive heater, it was very good, but the 200 and 300 watt would split open, overheat and that type of stuff. And most of the cases were due to too much heat building up at the source of the heater, not malfunction on, is it turning on or off enough? Anything like that. It was flow in the aquarium and packing too much heat into a small container. So now the company, we, we talked to them, uh, not Cobalt, but the company that actually manufactures it, they only make, I believe, up to 150 watt currently, and they're doing very rigorous testing on the 200 watt and the 300 watt to make sure that mistake can never happen again. They basically need a fail safe, so if it starts overheating, it shuts down and won't let it split. Now, does that mean maybe making the heater longer? That might be true. Does it mean uh, possibly limiting the wattage? Yes, one of those two things have to be true. Either disperse more heat or limit wattage. And uh, so far, they, the easiest thing is to limit the wattage. Great, people buy multiple heaters and they don't have that problem anymore. So that's the truth behind heaters. Conserve heat as much as possible because it'll save you money and heartache. There's a reason I heat my whole building here. I don't really even have to use heaters unless I'm doing with discus or rams or something that needs a slight more bump. But I try to make it so that there, you know, my fish room in general can go anywhere from 72 to 82, depending on time of year. And I let those swings happen like they naturally would because it's not detrimental to fish or your plants or anything like that. So I believe as a hobbyist, we should ask for, give us a heater that will cycle five or six degrees before kicking on and off. That is what we want, not 0.2 degrees. That's the opposite. But an uninformed hobbyist will go, ooh, 0.2 accuracy, real accurate. That's the one I want, when in reality, now that we got this little bit of info, we want that spread. So good luck, get those aquariums buttoned up, manage that heat and minimize the amount of wattage you gotta use to minimize your exposure.